In this episode, I will use the Venn diagram approach to discuss the initial differential diagnosis in travel medicine cases. Just a reminder that Venn diagram approach benefits from the overlap of several data to make a final diagnosis. In this episode, I will benefit from history, epidemiologic data, and provide an extra additional clinical bit of information as I mentioned it in the other section in this episode I will cover only the incubation period of febrile illnesses among the febrile travelers but in a different episode I will discuss different clinical findings by systems this slide summarizes the history taking questions that will come handy when approaching any case or patient with travel related issues. As you can see, there are three categories. One is the general history of travel focusing on time and location. The other includes specific exposure history. And finally, we include immunization history. What are the five general history taking questions to ask for any case of travel medicine? When did you travel? How long did you travel? What kind of places did you stay in? Where did you visit? And what was the main reason for your trip? Now, let's review some differential diagnosis related to these questions. If a patient with history of recent travel mentions travel during the rainy season, what are the differential diagnosis considerations? Rainy season travel is associated with mosquito-borne infections such as malaria, dengue, Japanese encephalitis, chikungunya, and West Nile virus. What about travel during the dry season? The top of the differential is meningococcal diseases. Now, if the patient mentions that the travel lasted a long period of time, what will be the top consideration for the symptoms? Tuberculosis. How about the patient visiting local house or rudimentary constructions? The differential diagnosis mainly includes vector-borne and rodent-borne pathogens or illnesses. Now, for patients who visited the rural areas, what are the differential considerations? Again, vector-borne diseases, but also food and water-borne pathogens, given the fact that many areas of the world especially in the rural areas, the food and water sanitation is not highly standardized. And finally, if the patient says the main purpose of travel was visiting friends and relatives, what are the possible considerations? Mainly con consider diseases that can be transmitted by person to person and among the travel medicine cases, these are enteric fever and tuberculosis, but also possibly malaria. You don't necessarily need to think of malaria or enteric fever as transmitted by person to person, but we are talking about non-specific travel purpose here. In other words, the patient who does not mention any specific exposure other than exposing to friends and relatives. Next is specific exposure during travel. So what are important history taking questions to consider for specific exposure coverage in cases of travel medicine? What did you do? What did you eat or drink? Did you have unpasteurized products? Did you eat any undercooked foods or raw foods? Did you have any exposure to insects? Did you have any tick bites or did you go hiking or walk through tall grasses or woods? Did you notice any fleas or other vectors or bugs or very around animals that might have had fleas or lice? Were you in large gatherings? Did you participate in digging, excavating or construction? Did you swim, wade or splash around in fresh water? Did you have close contact with any animals, any bites, scratches or ticks? And finally, did you have sexual contact or contact with blood, body fluids, secretions or procedures that may expose you to these body fluids. Now, in response to the answering question of what did you do or the main activity the traveler was involved with, we need to consider indoor versus outdoor exposure. If the patient has mainly stayed indoors, what are the possible differentials? Conditions again as 
I mentioned earlier on that are associated with person to person but also blood secretions or direct contact and these include what HIV hepatitis meningococcus and TB on the other side if the patient has mainly stayed outdoors what are the possibilities to consider ticks mosquitoes and other vectors associated infections such as malaria rickettsial fever and leishmaniasis okay moving on to the next question what did you eat or drink this is easy as you may know any consumption of undercooked meats products with questionable hygiene raw vegetables or drinking tap water or ice in drinks is associated with transmission of especially enteric gram negatives but also the hepatitis viruses that are transmitted fecal orally do you remember what are the hepatitis a and e now don't forget amoebic uh, dysentery and liver abscess that also belongs to this category now do you remember the infections that are transmitted by consumption of unpasteurized dairy for example homemade cheese always remember brucella but also listeria what about the neonates uh, remember congenital toxoplasma infection is also associated with consumption of unpasteurized dairy in pregnant women now when it comes to undercooked food we have a special category of undercooked shellfish do you remember what box could be transmitted by under consumption of undercooked shellfish well I'm sure most of you remember Vibrio if you remember from our helminth episode Colonorsis sinensis and Paragonimus vestermini are the examples of flukes that are transmitted by crustaceans and finally never forget hepatitis A is also transmitted by shellfish please remember hepatitis A different species of Vibrio and Colonorsis and Paragonimus that are transmitted by shellfish again bridging to our helminth episode do you remember what uh, type of helminths could be transmitted by consumption of aquatic vegetables such as watercress fasciolas either fasciola hepatica or fasciolopsis busci we already discussed rainy season association with mosquito-borne illnesses so let's discuss what are the possibilities other than rickettsial infections and Lyme that everyone knows for the tick-borne illnesses never forget Babesia anaplasma erlichia and Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever among tick-borne illnesses now the question of flea-borne illnesses is the same as exposure to animals what are the differential consideration for fleas exposure or being around animals rickettsia typhi or endemic typhus as well as yersinia pestis these are specifically for flea what about lice infestation of the animal rickettsia provoziki causing epidemic not endemic typhus but epidemic typhus p for provoziki epidemic for provoziki as well as Borrelia causing relapsing fever how about exposure to animals carrying mites what's the disease the disease is scrub typhus transmitted by Orientia susugamushi do you remember the diseases carried by vectors such as sand flies black flies yes for Sandfly as vector, we have Leishmania, and for black flies, we have Uncocerca volvulus or African river blindness. Remember what are the vectors for trypanosomiasis? For American trypanosomiasis, we have triatomine bugs and triatomine bugs, is the other name. And for African trypanosomiasis, we have tsetse flies. If a patient mentions that he has been in involved in large gatherings or attended large gatherings what are the considerations let's think of airborne particles logically such as influenza and other respiratory infections as well as measles if a traveler or any patient in general mentions in his history involvement in digging excavation or construction work and he has any type of 
infectious symptoms could it be respiratory could it be bone could it be skin involvement and rash what are the top of the list considerations dimorphic fungi especially coccidioides initis and histoplasma capsulatum now patient who mentions history of swimming or splashing around in fresh water and now has infection other than encephalitis I mentioned encephalitis because that will be neglaria. But if the patient mentions other infectious symptoms after swimming or wading and splashing around in fresh water, what are the diagnostic considerations? For long term symptoms, you may consider schistosomes, like if there's a combination of GI and liver variceal vascular symptoms, you may think of schistosoma japonicum and schistosoma mansoni or if the patient has urinary symptoms we may think of schistosoma hematobium however if the patient has more acute manifestations after swimming and splashing around you may think of leptospira once more this is a very three-tier important differential diagnosis a patient has been exposed to water of some sort you remember in the Helmand's discussion we mentioned flukes um, now if it is long term it's schistosomes if it is short term it is leptospira and if it is meningoencephalitis like we are thinking of amoebic meningoencephalitis such as neglaria now we mentioned the exposure to animals in terms of animal infestation with fleas lice mites being mainly responsible for rickettsial infections including endemic or epidemic typhus or scrub typhus for flea lice and mite respectively but this is usually in association with domesticated animals animal exposure could also include wild animal exposure or exposure to primates rodents and birds so let us go through this and again these are not necessarily travel medicine cases if a patient has been involved with the spelunking and uh, indicates bites and now has come with headache, what is the possible consideration? Rabies. Again, remember, patient may just have no symptoms and just mentions a bite during caving and spelunking. What are the differential considerations in the patient with respiratory illness and exposure to birds? Uh, always on top of the list, consider Chlamydophila cetaci and avian influenza, even though in the immunocompromised cryptococcal uh, infection should be also on top of the list. Now, what diseases could be transmitted by rodents, such as rats? And by exposure, we mean bite, scratching, or leaking, or any type of exposure. Always remember Yersinia pestis is still there, hantavirus disease, Lassa fever, and other hemorrhagic fevers, and as we initially mentioned, rickettsia typhi, the endemic typhus. Whenever there is rats, there is fleas, and there is Yersinia or endemic typhus, as a general rule of thumb. Now a local or international traveler who is involved with handling animals has a type of febrile illness. Regardless of the nature of the disease, what are the differentials to consider? Brucella, anthrax, coxilla brunettii, francisella tularensis, and toxoplasma. Again, you know uh, rabbit skinning association with francisella. Being involved in the birth process of domesticated animals could be associated with coxilla. And handling animals in general is associated with brucella and anthrax as well as Yersinia pestis. And finally, we have contact with bodily fluids. What are the examples, by the way? Sexual contact, injection transfusion, medical procedures, tattooing, piercing, and dental work, or shaving by barber. What are the diseases to be considered in the differential in these exposures? Acute HIV, hepatitis A, B, C, and D, cytomegal virus and Epstein Barr virus, syphilis, viral hemorrhagic fevers. All of these are examples of conditions that are transmitted, transmitted or transmissible by contact to bodily fluids. 
Okay, so this was specific exposure. Now, what are the two types of immunization or vaccination to be considered among travelers? One is you as a physician need to make sure that the patient has updated routine immunization. And the other thing is based on the region of travel, you need to have a specific travel immunization considerations. Now, what are the routine immunizations categories to consider? Uh, you would like to consider MMR, polio, Tdap, hepatitis B, influenza, and chicken pox, as well as age-specific recommendations. Now, can you give examples of vaccinations that are given by age? Uh, HPV, shingles, and pneumococcal vaccines. For example, among the elderly, they need pneumococcal. Younger people need HPV. And then what are the vaccine recommendations for asplenic hosts, hosts? Asplenic patients require vaccination against Haemophilus influenza B and meningococcus and pneumococcus. And finally, provide examples of vaccines specifically provided to travelers. Japanese encephalitis, polio, rabies, typhoid, yellow fever, and hepatitis A. Now I would like to discuss a bit the differential diagnosis based on most common illnesses among travelers by region and system involvement. Now I don't want us to memorize this epidemiologic hierarchical differentials. However, I want you to have some general ideas, for example, to know the top countries in Southeast Asia versus Northeast Asia or uh, the difference of the, say, mm, number one cause of febrile illness in North Africa versus Sub-Saharan Africa and things like that. So beginning with Southeast Asia, uh, first of all, do you know that countries that belong to this region? You need to have some general idea, don't memorize this list, but the countries include Brunei, Burma or Myanmar, Cambodia, Timor, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, Laos. Okay, what are the most common GI symptoms or pathogens and by the GI symptom or pathogen, we are mainly dealing with diarrheal illness or traveler diarrhea among a patient from Southeast Asian region. Always remember Campylobacter, Giardia, Salmonella, and also Estrangeloides. Now, if you have a patient with respiratory symptoms from Southeast Asian countries, what are the most likely differential diagnosis that you should consider? Influenza, TB, strep pharyngitis, mycobacteria other than TB, legionella, and pertussis. I want you to always come into memory at least the first couple first differentials. In the case of respiratory illnesses, influenza and TB is important in Southeast Asia. Now, you have a patient again from Southeast Asia with dermatologic complaints. He's a traveler. What are the top of the list that you should not miss? Remember, you should make sure that the patient does not need rabies post-exposure prophylaxis. Also, the second most common differential is cutaneous larva migrants. Other possible considerations include the scabies and envenomation or envenomation. Okay, next we discuss South Central Asia. What are the countries in this region? Now, South Central Asia includes countries like India, Bangladesh, and the I call them stands countries such as Afghanistan, Pakistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, etc. Okay, what about the GI complaints in this region? Most common cause of diarrheal illness is Giardia, then it's Shigella and Amoeba. What about respiratory illness? The pattern is similar to Middle East and North Africa that we will discuss later. What about dermatologic complaints in countries from uh, in patients from South Central Asian countries? Uh, again, rabies, post-exposure prophylaxis, cutaneous leishmaniasis, scabies, cutaneous larva migrants. But here, special remember leprosy. 
what is the specific pattern of febrile illness differentials in patients from South Central Asia, enteric fever and dengue virus are the leading causes. This is followed by Plasmodium vivax, chikungunya, and extrapulmonary TB. Now let's discuss the pattern of most common illnesses from travelers from Middle East and North Africa that are bundled together. Uh, you probably know almost all countries from Middle East because there is the center of non-ending international and world conflict forever. But what I want you to remember is the difference between North African countries and Sub-Saharan Africa. Think of the rich African countries to belong to the region of Middle East, North Africa. And what are they? Algeria, Egypt, Libya, Morocco, Sudan, Tunisia, Western Sahara. Remember, these countries, just few of them are there, but they produce one third of total African continent's GDP. And so also there's no doubt that there is always conflicts there because these are rich, most likely oil rich countries. This information comes handy when you want to compare with sub-Saharan African countries. What are the common GI infections? Again, similar to other Asian countries we discussed, we are dealing with GI, DI campylobacter, other gram-negative rods and estrangeloides. So nothing new there. It's very similar to the pattern in South Central Asian countries. Now, when it comes to respiratory infections, Please remember the pattern of South Central Asian countries such as India, Pakistan is similar to that of Middle East and North Africa and that is TB followed by influenza, followed by strep pharyngitis and atypical mycobacteria and pertussis. However, one specific thing you may expect in South Central Asian countries given the Himalayan and other mountainous regions are located is that in South Central Asian countries we have high altitude pulmonary edema as a common cause of respiratory illness among patients or travelers in South Central Asian countries such as Pakistan. What about the dermatologic pattern? Again, it is similar to that of South Central Asia and that includes rabies, post-exposure prophylaxis requirement, cutaneous leishmaniasis, scabies, cutaneous larva migrants, and again here we have envenomation. Even though we have several cases of leprosy in some Middle Eastern cities, the entire Middle East is not considered an endemic region when compared to South Central Asia. So I'm trying to compare so that you also can remember this. Now, what are the leading differentials of febrile illness among patients or travelers from Middle East and North Africa? Here is the very important differential that helps differentiate it from South Central Asia. Remember, hepatitis A is the leading cause of febrile illness in Middle East and North Africa. This is followed by Plasmodium falciparum. Remember, in South Central Asia, such as India, Pakistan, the leading cause of febrile illness is enteric fever and dengue, and the most common Plasmodium is Plasmodium vivax. But in Middle East and North Africa, Plasmodium falciparum is the most common cause. Please commit this to memory that also brucella and Q fever are common in Middle East and North African region. So almost everything is similar in terms of different diseases and epidemiologic data of them between South Central Asia and Middle East and North Africa, except for the febrile illness in which in Middle East we have hepatitis A, plasmodium falciparum, brucella and Q fever while in South Central Asia, number one is enteric fever followed by dengue fever. This brings us, brings us to the next topic, Sub-Saharan African epidemiologic data of the most common illnesses. Regarding GI, you are still dealing with the same mm, most common pathogens, GRDI, strongyloides, campylobacter, other enteric gram negatives. Respiratory is similar also to North Africa, so we have TB, influenza, and strep pharyngitis. Now, one main difference between sub-Saharan African countries, which includes like all other African countries other than the rich countries I mentioned, with that of North Africa, Middle East, is that leishmaniasis is not the most common cause, but 
cutaneous larva migrants is the most common cause of dermatologic complaints in sub-Saharan Africa. By the way, can you name some of the sub-Saharan African countries? We're dealing with countries like Angola, Benin, Botswana, Burkina Faso, um, Cameroon, Central African Republic, Chad, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, and other many other countries, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Gabon, Gambia, Ghana, Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, Kenya, Liberia, Madagascar, etc., etc. Now, a patient with febrile illness from any of the countries I mentioned has what most common differentials to be considered. Here, Plasmodium falciparum is the top of the list, followed by spotted fever, rickettsial illnesses. Then we have dengue, bivax, and enteric fever. Once more, remember, Sub-Saharan Africa, number one cause is falciparum. Middle East, North Africa, number one cause is hepatitis A, then falciparum. And in South Central Asia, enteric fever and dengue are the most common cause. Falciparum is not very common in South Central Asia. And yes, this is the information you need to know. Okay, we are just left with Latin America and Caribbeans. What's a specific pattern of GI pathogens or diarrheal illness that we should be aware about the patients or travelers from Latin America and Caribbean countries? Remember amoeba, such as the Entamoeba fragilis and Entamoeba histolytica are a leading cause of GI illness and diarrheal disease. Any change about the respiratory infections? No, we are dealing with influenza, TB, Legionella, pertussis, etc. that we have in all other regions. How about dermatologic conditions? Again, not anything striking. The cutaneous larva migrants in, Ameri in South American and Caribbean regions, similar to Sub-Saharan Africa, is the leading cause of dermatologic complaints among travelers. However, you can think of it as a mixed pattern between Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa in regard to the fact that cutaneous leishmaniasis here again shows up, something that we didn't have in Sub-Saharan Africa. Important question, if you are asked what's the leading cause of febrile illness in travelers from Latin America and Caribbeans, always include dengue fever on top of your list. The rest is similar to the other regions. So, once more, the most common cause of febrile illness in Latin America and Caribbean traveler is dengue. In Sub-Saharan Africa is falciparum. In North Africa, rich African countries and Middle East is hepatitis A. And in South Central Asia, it is enteric fever. Okay, let's discuss some epidemiologic data from some of the developed countries. European Union, North Americas, and Australia. GI, what are the most common causes? Well, you need to know the leading cause of the areal and GI complaints from travelers from North Americas, Oceania, and European Union. Remember, in North America is Giardia, in Oceania and Australia is Strongyloides, and in my European Union, we have Campylobacter jejuni. Remember, Amoebas are a common cause of overall diarrheal uh, disease in developed countries except in Europe. What is the leading cause of respiratory illness in developed countries? Influenza. Um, remember these are statistics prior to current pandemic, but whether or not the global statistics have been influenced significantly is something that needs to be published later on. What's the most common infectious dermatologic complaint among travelers to these developing co developed countries? Requirement for rabies post-exposure prophylaxis. Now talking about febrile illness. And again, we are not talking about febrile illness among the residents. We are talking about the febrile illness among the travelers to these countries in North America. Is uh, coccidioides and rickettsial fever are common in Australia, plasmodium with vax and dengue is common and in Europe acute HIV and hepatitis A as well as non-pulmonary TB is common. This means the type of febrile illness most commonly seen among travelers. 
At the end, I would like to discuss the rich Asian countries such as China, Japan, South and North Korea, uh, Russia and Far East. If you are asked in what region of the world Ascaris and tapeworms are common cause of GI illness among travelers, uh, remember North Asia, Northeast Asian countries. Now, pattern of respiratory infections are not different from the rest of the world in regard to the fact that influenza and TB are the leading causes. Same is true about dermatologic patterns. Uh, rabies, post-exposure prophylaxis, cutaneous larva migraines, and scabies. Febrile illness, the leading cause from travelers of Northeast Asian countries is dengue. Does it ring a bell? Yes. Similar to the pattern that we had in Latin America and Caribbean. So if you have a traveler with febrile illness from either Latin America or Caribbean or the Northeast rich Asian countries. What's the leading cause of febrile illness among them? Dengue fever. Again, don't try to memorize this, but I would like you to have some idea about the exceptions and the differences and the leading causes of the disease among travelers from each region of the world. I'll give examples with a couple of cases at the end so that you can see how combining these information with the historic data and other clinical data will come really handy in the diagnosing and managing the patients. Next, I would like to discuss our third tier of the Venn diagram, and that is other clinical data. I just provide one example here, and I will discuss the differential diagnosis of uh, infectious diseases among travelers by organ system in a different episode. But here I want to give you just one example on how knowledge of incubation period of febrile illness would help differentiation. So regarding travelers with febrile illness, we need to be very careful about the incubation period because the pathogens or differential that cause febrile illness with seven to ten days of exposure or travel are different from those causing febrile illness after 10 to 14 days of travel exposure. Now what is the most common pattern of infection among travelers in regards to the incubation period? Remember most infections associated with travel occur within 14 days and that includes the 7 to 10 days period. What are these differentials? Hemorrhagic fevers, arboviral diseases, rickettsial infection, and zoonotic diseases. So among hemorrhagic fevers, can you name some of them? Hunter fever, Lhasa, Ebola. How about arb arboviral diseases? Chikungunya, dengue, Zika virus, arboviral encephalitis such as Japanese encephalitis and West Nile virus and how about rickettsial infections uh, Rocky Mountain spot fever, ehrlichiosis, different types of typhus and, and typhoidal fevers relapsing fever, Q fever and Lyme disease and how about the zoonotic and other diseases within the 10 to 14 days um, Plague, tularemia, anthrax, and bartonellosis. These are the top of the list zoonotic infections. Now, few diseases would manifest among the febrile illnesses after two weeks of travel or exposure. Among travelers, what are these diseases? Always remember liver infection and schistosomiasis, hepatitis B virus, and visceral leishmaniasis. By the way, do you remember what liver infections have this incubation period that happens after two weeks? Uh, almost all hepatitis viruses as well as amoebic liver disease. Remember how long was the incubation period for hepatitis B? It was even longer, it was six weeks. So if a patient who is traveling and has hepatitis symptoms contracted it within two weeks, think about acute hepatitis, otherwise Think about hepatitis B virus infection, which could be either acute or chronic. And finally, the top of the list of chronic infections and those with incubation period, 
usually more than 10 to 14 days are TB and malaria. Now, is there any exception to this rule of malarial incubation period? Yes, while incubation period for um, most malarial infections is considered to be longer than 14 days, Plasmodium falciparum and sometimes Plasmodium vivax can have shorter incubation periods. Now, remember this subdivision of incubation period is not carved in stone. Uh, some references just consider it long-term versus short-term with cutoff point being four weeks. Some other references have it seven days and some have it 10 days as their cutoff point. So if you are asked what are the febrile illnesses with long incubation period among travelers, common list is brucella, hepatitis, schistosoma, leishmana, HIV, liver infection, TB, malaria, trypanosomiasis, syphilis, and amoeba, amoebic liver disease. And if you're asked what are the causes of febrile illness with short incubation period, almost everything else belongs to this category, including tick-borne illnesses, mosquito-borne illnesses, arboviral infections, acute hepatitis, less than four weeks we mean, rickettsial infection, and leptospira and hysteria. Okay, at the end I would like to discuss a couple of cases to put this Venn diagram of three-tier approach all together. Case one is a traveler from Southeast Asia with febrile illness within first week of return or exposure. What is the most likely other clinical findings in this patient? Other Clinical findings in this patient include possibility of low platelet and hemorrhage. Why? Because the most common cause of acute incubation period, febrile illness, in travelers from Southeast Asia is dengue fever. What is the next step in the diagnosis of this patient? PCR and, if possible, NS1 antigen ELISA. Next case is a traveler from Angola with periodic fever within around seven days of return. This is associated with headache. What's the next step in the assessment of this patient? Peripheral blood smear with thin and thick smears. And the most likely diagnosis is Plasmodium falciparum. Again, remember in sub-Saharan Africa, such as Angola, Plasmodium falciparum is the leading cause of febrile illness. And remember that even though we say Plasmodia are usually having longer than seven day incubation period, Plasmodium falciparum, as I initially mentioned, is an exception. It can have a short incubation period. What clue in the history helps the diagnosis of falciparum in addition to the sub-Saharan region and short incubation period for periodic fever, presence of neurologic signs such as headache. By the way, do you remember what is the most common cause of febrile illness if this patient was from North Africa such as say Algeria or Egypt? Yes, yeah, similar to Middle East, it will be hepatitis A virus. And so the next step will be hepatitis serology. Next is the case of a phone call consultation from a travel agency inquiring about prophylaxis for different travelers. They are specifically interested to know what are the most common causes of febrile illness in their upcoming Asian tour. The tour includes the itinerary that moves from Malaysia to India and then ends in Middle East before their return. Remember, in the Thailand, Southeast Asia, and Malaysia, the number one cause of febrile illness is dengue fever. In India, it is enteric fever, and in Middle East, it is hepatitis A virus. This finishes our discussion of initial differential diagnosis among travelers.